You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have an animal behaviorist, Mark Beckoff. He's a professor emeritus of ecology and evolutionary biology at University of Colorado Boulder. He's a fellow of the Animal Behavior Society and a past Guggenheim fellow. Um, he's had many awards and a, a long career, but I wanted to talk to him uh, again about animal behavior because it's rare to find someone that, uh, that's studying that. So, Mark, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on your show. It sounds uh, very interesting to me. Oh, good. Well, what got you interested in animal behavior? And when we talk about animal, you know, what kind of animals? All animals or certain ones? Yeah, I mean, I've really been interested in animal behavior and, you know, all aspects of protecting other animals since I'm probably two, my folks say, that I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and... Um, I was always asking them what the local dogs and cats and squirrels and even insects and birds were thinking and feeling. So I'm one of those lucky people who found my niche early on and just was hell bent to pursue it as a career when I was old enough. Yeah, that's great. When I've uh, gone to a steakhouse with my wife, I always tell her they should have a like a dog shelter right next door because the steakhouse could feed all the extra food that's not eaten to the dogs. And- yeah, her. yeah, and I would probably work to close the steakhouse. <laughs> but, oh, well, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. But, I but no, that's a, no. I understand what you're saying. I mean, I, I, you know, some people think I'm radical. <clears throat> I don't know how radical I really am, but, but I still think that you know we all need to work together with you know people who have different views and make the world a better place for all beings, non-human yeah. and human, and that's. That's basically what my major projects are right now is working for the well-being of all beings. So are, are there any particular animals that you studied that uh, like really fascinate you and maybe we can go into detail? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I've been studying dogs forever. And I think recently you interviewed Jessica Pierce, with whom I wrote Unleashing Your Dog that came out last year. Right. Um, but I did long-term field study of coyotes living in the Grand Teton National Park outside of Jackson, Wyoming. Um, I did about an eight and a half or nine year study. And they're fascinating because the minute one starts talking about the coyote, um, you realize that they're really variable and there's, there's really no animal who you can call the coyote and bringing it home for some people. There's really no animal you can call the dog because all dogs are unique and they have unique personalities and temperaments. Um, I also did field work on Adelie penguins, the little penguins who, black and white little penguins who um, live in Antarctica. And I discovered that they too, they all, you know, people think they look alike and, and they do, but you get to know individuals when you spend countless hours watching them. Um, But they also have very unique personalities and uh, temperaments. So um, yeah, I, have a, I have a question that comes to mind. Yeah. So some of the animals you studied really aren't in contact with people very often. And then some animals like dogs are in contact with them constantly. Do you think that 
um, do you see a lot of personality variation in animals that aren't in contact with people versus ones that do, like dogs, or is it us making it up in our minds, like anthropomorphizing? No, excuse me. No, there's a lot of differences in personality among animals who um, don't have contact with people. That's a really good question. I mean, because the place in Antarctica where we studied penguins is about a quarter of a million of them. And there's been some research teams there. But typically, just for a short period of time when, the, you know, when the weather and the climate is OK, um, Oh, no, you've got bold penguins and shy penguins and, you know, sometimes just obnoxious penguins who, you know, try to attack you and, you know, flip their flipper wings into your leg. Um, Their wings are bone. And I got hit by one who was really assertive and it almost broke my femur. And so... No, you do. And the the same with the coyotes I studied. I mean, you know, once again, they see people, but certainly not as not as regularly as they see dog um, as dogs see people. And no, it's the same thing. And what's really interesting is when they're born and they come out of their dens at around three weeks of age, you've got all the personalities that you can imagine, bold, shy, arrogant, obnoxious. Um, and, they've, and they've all had the same parents in the same little hole in the ground. And the same with dogs. I mean, that's why I always say, you know, there's no the dog. There's no universal dog um, because dogs have soon after birth. There's been some studies. Um, there's very distinct differences in their personalities and temperaments as well. And. Mm. You know, nobody really knows why other than, you know, if you're an evolutionary biologist, you kind of think of evolution working on different be- patterns of behavior, for example, or, you know, different sized or colored animals. Yeah. And, you know, we, ju- we don't know why these things have, a- why these differences have arisen, but, but it's true. And, you know, it's the same for it's the same for humans. I mean, I know some identical twins who are as different as thoroughly unrelated human beings. So to me, my research has really, it hasn't focused on only that, but I was really intrigued the first time I saw wild coyotes come out of a hole in the ground and they were as different as night and day. So, um, yeah. Well, I've noticed like there's always one animal that is greedy for food and will push the other ones out of the way. Like I've seen this with stingrays at the uh-huh. aquarium with, with fish, with dogs, with, it's funny. There's always one that's like a hog and wants all the food, you know? Yeah. They, you know, they vary. I mean, once again, just like humans, you know, they vary across a spectrum and, um, and, and from a biological point of view, you would expect that variation. You know, in, in other words, you know, that all individuals are not going to be the same. And so, for example, when I studied coyotes and I've done some observations on wild wolves, even birds living in the foothills outside of Boulder, you know, you can't form a group of all alpha or dominant individuals, if you will. You know, it's hard to form a group um, of all bold people, you know, and so the variation in personalities, for example, (coughs) help to form a group and maintain the group. And you see that, you know, in numerous social species, yeah. Uh, including fishes, and you see it in humans. So there's a lot of similarities across the board um, in that aspect of behavior. How far down do you think that different personality types go? Like, you know, in, in what we call simpler organisms, like how far down do you think it goes based on your experience? Yeah, well, I don't think of down and up, just to be honest. But, you know, okay. I mean, I mean, you know, because that means that there's a hierarchy. But, you know, people who study reptiles – and amphibians see large differences among, um, you know, large individual differences in what we would call personality. I mean, some people resist using those phrases for, like, you know, what you said, maybe these so-called simpler um, organisms. But there's been great studies on fishes that show very clearly that they show the same spectrum of personalities as do dogs, wolves, coyotes, and humans. Wow. Again, 
And, and the same, you know, I've been in my field work, I've come across, you know, different animals. And when I was in Africa, um, we met some crocodiles. I mean, we, we, we met them at a <laughs> We met him at a distance, of course, but, but, you know, the guy that, you know, who knew some of the individuals said, you know, the first thing he said was, you know, you want to stay away from all of them, you know, just as a precaution, but that, you know, certain individuals were more, were bolder and some were shy. And so as a, as a research scientist, I just keep the door open on all these possibilities just because because the minute you think you know everything, maybe the second you think you know everything, you really learn that there's a lot you don't know. And so right. keeping the door open um, on behavioral differences. And also, you know, that question about personality, you know, people talk about so uh, simpler organisms. And, you know, when you really get into the nitty gritty of studying most organisms, the word simple goes out the window just because they're simple when you don't understand a lot about them. You know, so, so when I started doing some work, well, with the, some of the work on penguins, you know, you know, people would go, well, they all look alike, they all behave alike. And then, you know, literally, you just hang out with them for a couple of hours and you go, well, that's just not true. You know, they share the same basic patterns of behavior, but they don't all behave the same. Okay. Yeah. So what's, um, I don't know, what's your overall like feel or gestalt now that you worked with a lot of animals in a lot of different contexts over many years? How do you feel about them now versus when you first started working with them? Like, what are some insights or things that really have stuck with you over time working with them? <clears throat> well, the variability is one. But among the things that I've really come to appreciate are large individual differences among animals, as I've said, you know, both within and between species. And the other thing that I've come to appreciate is how similar they are. So, for example, in the long-term field studies of uh, coyotes living in the Grand Teton National Park, you know, we discovered there's a lot of variability. Um, coyotes can live alone. They can live as a mated pair or they can live in a pack like wolves. And it turns out that the major determinant, um, the one variable that influences how they live is how much food there is in the winter to keep the family together. That if there's enough food for you know mom, dad, their children, and perhaps other pack members, then they'll hang out. And if there's not enough food, they'll, um, they'll leave. Another thing that we discovered, and um, this is something that I've worked with Jessica Pierce on, we wrote a book called Wild Justice, where we were looking at the moral lives of animals. Um, and one of the things that attracted me was how they play fairly, how they have certain signals, like dogs do what we call the bow. Everybody who's lived with a dog probably knows the bow, where they crouch on their front legs and they put their hind end in the air, and sometimes they'll wag their tail and bark. And that's an invitation to play. And if you go to dog parks or you just hang out with dogs, you know that they learn to play fairly, that there are certain rules of the game. And so, you know, once again, you know, it was, you know, nobody really knew what was going on until I and my students did my, did, you know, did our research. So there's this notion of fairness and you can look at it in terms of sharing food among anim among individuals in a group. Um, primates form what you call these grooming networks where, you, you know, you can go online and you can see a bunch of chimpanzees or um, baboons or different monkeys. They're in a line and they're all grooming one another. And so are there cheetahs in the system? Yeah, there's some individuals who try to do nothing and get the benefits of you know, being in the group, but what we discovered, and it's really fascinating, is that young coyotes who don't play fair ultimately leave their group because they can't bond with other coyotes, and they suffer higher mortality. And so cheating in play doesn't really pay off in the big, you know, in the big picture, <clears throat> and the coyotes keep track of if you will, who the cheetahs are and 
you know, who are the cheaters and who are the uh, animals who play fair? And you see the same in humans. You know, we, you know, we label people, oh, they're not very fair or they don't pull their weight or something like that. So, you know, that's another aspect of behavior that came from these really, really long-term studies. So there's like Bertie Madoffs in the uh, coyote world too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but they don't, they don't do as well. <laughs> Although right, I said, right. I suppose you could say he ultimately didn't do as well, but, but yeah. And, you know, it's not a matter that they get away with what they can get away with, but you know, once again, <clears throat> life out in the wild is tough. And if you can get by and not pull your weight, that's okay. But once the group takes, takes notice that, you know, you're, there's a laggard around and they're not doing, pulling their weight then they, they just won't form the bond, you know, um, it's not like these individuals get driven out by other animals. What, what our research showed, which was very important, is that the other animals know who, say, are not the fair players, and so they won't accept their um, play invitations, and they avoid them. So it's, it's a very similar situation that I've heard of, you know, in young kids and elementary schools or in playgrounds, for example, that it's not like the other kids drive them out of the group. It's they just don't allow them in. And, and there's a very different, you know, big difference there if I fight with you and force you out of a group or I don't let you in in the first place. Um, and in the field, you know, suffering higher mortality is really a huge cost because it really basically means you're not going to go on and reproduce and make more babies who are going to carry your genes. And so that was one of the big things we found after countless hours and years of studying these animals. So, um, yeah, so we've also learned that you need to do long-term, an, you know, long-term studies on identified, identified animals so that you know who's who and you have some idea about their biographies. And how about uh, for a little while focusing on dogs? I guess because mm-hmm. I love dogs and a lot of people are familiar with them. What, what uh, interesting or unique things that you found out about dogs that most people don't know? <clears throat> well, w- the one thing I've mentioned is, you know, the intense amount of variability. But there's a lot of things, you know, one of the things about popular press about dogs is it's just filled with myths. And a lot of these myths become what we call memes. They're, they're, idea, they're just ideas that sail through mostly popular media and sometimes, uh, sometimes scientific media. So one that I've been focusing on is that dogs are not really our best friends. You know, it's, it sells books and it attracts headlines, but... Dogs aren't, if you will, humans' best friends. They're best friends with some humans, but dog abuse is rampant, for example. Um, And, you know, there's a lot of dogs who suffer immensely by trying to live in a human-oriented world. Um, So that's one thing. Another is that dogs are not unconditional lovers. You know, one of the bumper stickers that you'll see, if you will, or posters is that dogs are man's best friend or human's best friends, and they are unconditional lovers. And it turns out that dogs are extremely choosy about the individuals with whom they bond and who they come to love. Um, Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you've ever, if anybody's ever rescued an abused dog, you, you know that sometimes I mean, it can take a long time to rehabilitate them, and they're not just love muffins, if you will, who will love, you know, love everybody unconditionally. Um, you know, another is that dogs don't live in the present, you know, that the past really, really influences um, their behavior. And so a lot of times what people do is they come up with, you know, an animal, an individual who really doesn't exist. And from a research point of view, what's really fascinating is that you learn about all these facts and then you basically come to appreciate dogs for who, or, you know, for who they really are. And so, um, so I think that that's, you know, that to me is a very, very important, um, it's a very important thing to, you know, remember 
um, about yes. dogs, that they are individuals, they're not love muffins, and they're surely not our best friends. Well, I've noticed, like, in my own family, <clears throat> you know, my kids are getting there, they're growing up, but our dogs seem to definitely know that they're kids and they treat them differently and they're, they're more careful around them. And mm -hmm. you know, I've noticed, like, when people come over, for some reason, one of the dogs will like the people, the person. You know, sometimes they don't like it. You know, none of the dogs like them, but usually mm -hmm. the dogs, like, pick the person and the person picks the dog. It's just funny. It, it seems like the dogs, I guess, always are discerning, you know, who's in the house and who they'll be close to and how. And they have, like, different relationships with different people, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> dogs read us really well. <laughs> I mean, and, and what you just described is really interesting because, you know, some people have studied it. That, For example, if you pet a dog, turns out that their heart rate and blood pressure goes down, and so does ours, for example. But there's a connection before, and, and people don't really know what it is. You know, I'm not going to necessarily say it's like, you know, ESP or something like that. But people describe that mutual attraction really, um, you know, across breeds and across dogs. And the the last dog who I rescued, who I named Jethro, I mean, we locked eyes across a kennel here in Boulder, Colorado, or a kennel at the um, Bol the uh, Humane Society of Boulder Valley, and and we just locked eyes, and he was the dog that I wanted to bring home, and I did, and I. We lived together for 12, 12 and a half years. And I can't tell you what it was other than I'd been there. And you know what it's like when you go to these shelters. I mean, you want every dog because you feel sorry for them and they're just begging. They're begging for you to take them home. But there was something very unique. And after a couple of days of going, I just walked in and <clears throat> I wasn't expecting it to happen. And I walked in and the woman who was escorting me said, wow, what just happened? And I said, I want that dog. <laughs> and, and, and he wants me. Maybe it was a little arrogant, <laughs> but, um, but he wants me. So, so what, do, you, do you think dogs like, really care about us or they're just using us for food and shelter or what's your read there? Oh, no, no. <clears throat> I don't think dogs manipulate us at all. Of course they can, but no. I mean, I think that you develop this reciprocal and long-term, you know, enduring bond. And that when you're in a mutually caring, or you could say loving relationship, then they care about you like you care about them. So do dogs ever use us? Well, I'm sure they do sometimes, maybe not all dogs, but it's just like, I don't like casting people out as being selfish that way, that they're just using us for their own selfish ends. But so no, I... No, I think the, the, in the, you know, the history of domestication, if you will, or the domestication process would simply be that wolves became dogs, or you could say, how, how did dogs become dogs? And the way in which dogs became dogs was that people formed social relationships with wolves. Um, it was easy to do because wolves and people were social and cooperative. And then they selectively bred those individuals, you know, with whom they formed bonds. And over time, wolves, if you will, morphed into dogs. So I think that that reciprocal cooperative relationship has persisted. And so, yeah, I mean, I, dogs, we get, dogs get, dogs can get as much out of a healthy relationship as we get out of that healthy relationship. And it's not, one-sided because dogs are using us. They, it, the, whole, the whole system would not have um, evolved that way. Yeah. Do you know of anyone that um, is getting at all close to being able to communicate with a dog in its language and understanding the, you know, how dogs communicate? I mean, I guess, you know, the movement of their body and their tail and their posture and their eyes and their... Mm -hmm. and dogs, dogs seem to communicate on... I don't know, like five or six different levels. Sure. People seem to just stick mostly to verbal and then some body language and stuff. But, but you know, is anyone really pushing the frontiers and getting close to being able to literally communicate with a dog? Well, it depends on what you mean communicate. I mean, I think we communicate with dogs really well, you know, when we understand the general 
form of their communication. So, you know, we pay attention to, say, their tail, their ears, their facial expressions, their gait, their posture, their vocalizations. Um, are their eyes wide open? Are their ears erect? You know, and, and you know, other uh, variables like that. Um, you know, there are people who are interested in focusing on barking. You know, right now it's funny that we we really know very little about why dogs bark. I mean, you know, or why they howl at sirens. I mean, and it's fascinating because it's not a criticism of research. It's more just a very common, you know, common behaviors about which we don't know that much. And I and there are people who are interested in making these you know, translators, if you will, you know, the goal of which in the future would be to try to actually, you know, record a bark, look at context, and then try to say, well, the dog really is saying, is saying something, you know, with syntax or in a sentence that says, I'm hungry, I don't feel well, I want to go for a walk. Um, I, I'm not sure where I come down on that, because I'm not sure that we're going to be able to do it so explicitly. And I'm honestly not so sure that we're going to get all that much information, all that much additional information when we can do it. But, but if we could do it, I think it would be fascinating to have a certain vocalization, for example, and posture, say, and gestures that says, okay, I need to go out and pee or, hey, I want to go down the road and play with my best friend, Max or Mary. So yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm open for keeping I'm, I'm, I'm open for keeping the door open, if you will. Um, and in that research, you know, we'll probably learn a lot more about who dogs are. So, you know, it's a win win for everybody. And, and I always say that the more we learn about dogs and the more we appreciate them for whom they are, it's not only better for them, <clears throat> but it's better for us. Um, and it's better for the relationship we form because getting back to this, you know, dogs being unconditional lovers. Um, I spend a lot of time at dog parks cause that's what I get paid to do. And I like to do it. And I've had people come up to me and say, you know, is there something wrong with me? My dog hasn't really bonded with me. Um, she doesn't seem to love me. Or I've had people come up and say, you know, I just don't seem to have this magic with dogs. Is there something wrong with me? And I usually say to them, you know, no, it's not all about you because dogs are very choosy lovers. And um, so so these myths that prevail are they they're bad for the dogs and they're bad for humans. That's the only, I mean, that's the easiest way to summarize them. Have you ever um, worked with, you know, chimpanzees where they've taught them sign language and, you know, or have you looked at the science behind that or like, what have they discovered, for instance, about, you know, the animal mind, if you can call it one thing by, yeah. by doing that? Well, that's fascinating work. So the answer is I've never studied it, but, Years ago, I got to hang out with some of the famous chimpanzees like Washo, who learned um, ASL, American Sign Language, because I was a good friend of Roger Fouts, who did all of the most of the pioneering work in that field. And I was amazed. I mean, I have to tell you, I mean, I've hung out with really fascinating animals on different continents. <laughs> and watching these chim um, chimpanzees communicate with one another using ASL was just amazing. And what was really fascinating was that when Roger Fouts moved his research group from Oklahoma to Eastern Washington University, he stopped studying them. He felt that, you know, he had not that, not that he had necessarily answered all the pertinent questions, but he felt there was an ethical dimension to his research and that he didn't like, so he wanted to stop doing it. So these chimpanzees taught themselves sign language. <laughs> and he had, yeah, and he had video cameras in different parts of this large enclosure. I mean, you know, these are captive animals and there was no way they were ever gonna be, you know, re returned to wild chimpanzee habitat. So he basically had videos of these animals interacting with another, with one another, teaching one another sign language. 
And then I, I remember just sitting and watching some of these animals coming up and saying, I want your shoe in American sign language and, and pointing to your shoe. So, so really? I, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. So you can, so, I mean, what, you know, part of your question was what, what can that tell us about, you know, their, their minds and what it tells you about not only chimpanzee minds, but also the minds of other mammals, birds, fishes, reptiles, amphibians is that they're very active places that they're doing a lot of work, if you will, and that all these animals have very deep um, cognitive and emotional lives. And there's so much, what I love about what I do is that it's, almost daily you come across some new study or some new essay about all different you know all different um aspects of animal behavior from which you can make these really strong inferences about what's happening in their heads and in their hearts so i i love what i do yeah i just do 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 animals ask questions or when they you know learn asl for instance do they just issue commands on what they want. Like, you know, what's different about how an animal would talk when you observed it, you know, a chimp using sign language versus a person. Are there things they don't do or do that we don't do? I don't know that field well enough, but, but, but I do remember a chimpanzee pointing to my shoe and I wondered whether um, she it was, it was a female. She was asking me, can I have um, your shoe? Cause I don't know ASL, but um but but you know what you're asking? That's a really prescient question. Do they ask questions? Because they do. <laughs> you know, when they beg for food, for example, they they could be asking, "Can I have that food?" rather than just stealing it. Um, when a dog wants to play with another dog and does the bow or does some kind of action or makes a sound, they're asking the question, "Would you like to play with me?" So, well, are are they, or they're saying I want to play? Like, well, they could be they doing food. Right. They, well, no, they could they could be doing both. Um, they could be saying, "Do would you play with Would you play with me, or um, would you like to play with me, or um, you know, I want to play with you." And and that's a great question. And I th I think it's a little bit of both, and I think it depends on the relationship because we'll also see. Um, dogs, dogs, coyotes, and wolves, who I've studied, do something like bite another animal too hard and then do a bow. And what they're basically doing is punctuating the play sequence and saying something like, I'm sorry I bit you so hard, I want to play, or I'm going to bite you hard, but it's still play. And and I think what you're asking is a great question is, what are they doing? Are they saying, I want to play, please play with me, or do you want to play with me? And I'm not quite sure right, you know, on the, on the spur of the moment, I'm not quite sure how to parse that. So, but I do think it's a little bit of both. That would be my, um, that would be my impression. I guess there's probably no interviewer animals like me, but uh, <laughs> that's why I asked. <laughs> what did you say? I didn't. I didn't hear you. I, I, I constantly am asking questions, so maybe that's why I asked the question of whether they ask questions or if they just state their desires. So, yeah. well, no, that that's a great question. I I I would say that we have enough data to say it's it it's a little bit of both, depending on the context. I really do. Yeah. Um, okay. In fact, I, in fact, the, one of the first golden rules of play, I just thought of this, and, and you know, I've come up with these in my, my, my research, is ask first. So that play bow would be asking, you know, Richard, would you like to play with me? Um, That's true, yeah. I, yeah, no, it's, it's, this is great. I, that's why I love doing these kinds of interviews because it's really like, Richard, would you like to play with me? I want to play with you. And that's why play is such a valuable uh, place to look at these kinds of exchanges because, you know, oftentimes if animals are going to fight or going to have some kind of altercation, it's not like, would you like to fight with me? <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, I, wanted, I, want, I want what you have or I don't like what you did. So I think it's a little bit of both.
Yep. Have you, um, in terms of animal communication, again, it, I'm sure if we paid attention, we would have all the same modes of communication as other animals. Let's say dogs or chimpanzees or anything, but like, you know, take dogs. Supposedly, primarily, they're about smell. Yeah. The other senses are secondary to that, and I guess people are probably primarily about vision. So, has anyone done that kind of comparison? That you know, amongst animals, looking at their primary mode of experiencing the world, does that make them different in terms of personality or other differences? Right. That's a great question. So last year, I believe it was last year or two years ago, a bunch of scientists actually studied um, sort of um, olfactory acuity. And what they found was that humans aren't as bad, if you will, as we often cast ourselves out to be. And, you know, there's a whole literature that we actually pick up subconsciously or subliminally um, olfactory cues um, and that we use them in communication. Um, so my, my answer to that is that dogs, you know, sense of smell is at least a thousand times more sensitive than ours. So that's why we call dogs nosed animals. I like to say, you know, they, they sniff first and ask questions later. Um, and they're able to do that because, you know, it's totally dog appropriate to approach another dog or a human, as we know, and just stick your nose into all places on their bodies to get information. So I would have to say that um, dogs probably depend on odor, you know, more than we do. Um, and we definitely, you know, depend more on vision than do um, than dogs might. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. but but you know, it's classified a, a whole bunch of animals based on their seemingly primary mode of sensing. Yeah. You see differences amongst the, the visual ones versus the olfactory ones versus the the touch ones or the other ones, you know. Right. Well, you can pick up a lot of information, you know, versus touch, of course, vision and olfaction and, and audition or hearing. You know, you can pick up a lot of information, um, you know, in olfaction, even when an animal, another individual isn't there. You know, it's like walking into a locker room <laughs> and knowing that the people who were there had, were sweating and had just, you know, played a game right. of basketball or whatever. Um, so... So I think, you know, what happens with a lot of, you know, it happens with all animals, including people, is that, you know, we use the modalities and we focus on the modalities, um, you know, from which we get the most information. But, but what I was going to say, which is really important, and once again, you know, research has shown that dogs, like other animals, including human animals, get a lot of information from what we call composite signals and composite signals are signals <clears throat> that are a cocktail of information from all the different senses. So once again, you know, if you see a dog wagging his or her tail, don't make any assumptions that that dog is happy to see you or is in a good mood because the tail may be wagging, you know, slowly in a big kind of um, casual arc, or it could be going back and forth staccato size <clears throat> style, or, you know, it could be wagging its tail and growling at the same time. So yeah, I, I've seen in, in my dogs, you know, like um, I can tell when one of my dogs is agitated because his tail wags in an agitated way. Yep. Another one when he's mad, his tail starts going slow. And then when he's happy, it goes in a different way. So like, exactly. Right, right. Even within the same animal. It's, right. It's well, right. But, but what you're describing too, it's, you know, the same species, but they're different individuals. And that, that's a perfect example of how two dogs could communicate a similar message in different ways. And then of course, the interesting thing also is, do they communicate um, the same message in the same way. And what we've learned is that in messages of, I, I call them sort of messages of urgency, but, you know, when an animal is really aroused and stressed and, you know, potentially 
could be aggressive or assertive, there are certain characteristics of the sounds, for example, that really are a warning. You know, don't come closer. I don't want you closer or <clears throat> there's danger in the area. But but once again, just, you know, I think of my friends who, you know, I would interpret their behavior as they're being in a good mood and happy when, in fact, I know them well enough to know that they have little quirks. That means that they're really not in a great mood and happy, although other people would you know, express the same behaviors and be happy. True, true. Yeah, and so so what's great about your questions are that um, you know is that 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 we just once again can't come up with so many general rules that apply across um, all dogs, for example. Well, very good. Well, Mark, I wish I could talk to you a lot longer, but I'm out of yeah, time. Yeah, that's great. Thank what, you very much for your interest. Yeah, well, what, what's the best way for people to find out more and maybe get in touch or read work that you've done or get your books? The best way would just go to my website or my homepage, which is markbeckoff.com, M-A-R-C-B-E-K-O-F-F.com. There's tons of information there that's updated. And I also write regularly for Psychology Today. So if they want to know a lot about what you and I have just talked about, they could just do a web search for um, Mark Beckoff Psychology Today. That's great. Mark, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.